I'm Scott Allen Miller. It is the 2nd of December, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua. Today I'm doing something a little bit different, partially because I don't have a lot of time and I need to get today's episode out, but also because there's some really important information that I think a lot of people don't have and it's good for us to cover a little bit. If you've been watching my shorts, I've covered a little bit of news recently about what's going on with Venezuela and Guyana. And this is very important for Latin America. It's very important for the general region that we're in because it's part of the Caribbean, which Nicaragua is a part of. We're not super close in, in direct mileage, but it's part of our general region in a number of ways. And these countries are ones that we interact with quite a bit um, and are important here uh, in this region. So, whether you're interested in what's going on in Nicaragua, you're interested in world events, um, you're curious as to what's happening right now, or if you're looking at the greater Latin American community as something that you're interested in, potentially for moving, relocation, digital nomadry, uh, or possibly just vacationing, all things that are very popular for people who are watching this channel, then I think today we're going to cover some current events that are pretty important uh, for for you in looking at this region and understanding what's going on. So we're going to get to all that right after the bump. I'm not normally one to do the news on this channel. It doesn't normally fit too much uh, with what, I mean, we have a little bit of news like, oh, Nicaragua got new buses or whatever, but this is pretty important news. And I think the context of this is something that's absolutely missing for most people. And I had to do some research on it myself. Obviously it's, it's just not a region that anyone knows that well. So what is going on here? So the, the big picture is that there is a region that is currently considered to be a part of Guyana known as the Esquibo or the es Esequiba. It has a couple different names depending on who you talk to, but it is generally known as Esequibo or Guiana Esequiba. Uh, and it, the name depends whether you're talking to Spanish speakers from Venezuela or English speakers from Guyana, which of course is Guayana if you're talking about it in Spanish. This gets very confusing. So for those who are not familiar with the map, first of all, you should look at a map that's going to make this way easier. But uh, Venezuela is a relatively large country at the north central point of South America. Uh, the Guyanas are a group of countries starting with a region in eastern Venezuela and three countries uh, going east of there with Guyana, Suriname and French Guiana. The four together are known as the four Guyanas or the, the Guyanas in general. Uh, and, and the word Guyana just means many rivers or the land of much water or something like that. Uh, and this is the region famous for the Orinoco, uh, which is one of the world's bigger, more vast waterways, really, really significant in the region. The Essequibo is this borderland between Guyana and Venezuela. Traditionally, Going back to colonial times, um, early, early on, uh, this region was considered part of what would become Venezuela. This was part of the Spanish colony. Guyana has uh, occupied and controlled this region uh, since the 1800s. So there's a lot of history here. And what's happening now is that Guyana has generally been accepted uh, for the last few uh, generations as being the country that uh, controls this zone. Uh, however, this is a contested zone. And what is happening right now on the 3rd, so this is just a few days ago, uh, Venezuela finally went to a vote uh, of its people to see what the populace thought they should do about it. And the vote, which uh, outside sources have contested to some degree, although I've seen different stories from different Western outlets, uh, some saying that they said one thing, some they said another. So the Western outlets media does not agree as to what they consider uh, to have happened with this vote. So um, that's an important uh, view of this, that if you read the media pretty much anywhere in the West, you're going to see some questions about this vote. However, those questions conflict with each other. If you look at the Irish news, for example, uh, they say that Venezuela only made a claim that 2 million people turned out uh, for the event and that this was a relatively low turnout, but it's just a referendum. So you may not expect that many. Uh, and there were five questions 
on the referendum, basically all people answered all questions, because why wouldn't you? That would be logical. So they got about 10 million votes out of about 2 million voters, which is exactly what it seems like happened and what is what they claim Venezuela said. So kind of low voter turnout, but it's a referendum, not an election. Uh, in the United States, we're constantly seeing a claim that Venezuela said 10 million people turned out, so an expectation of 50 million voters uh, votes. Whether that is true or not, I have seen no reference to it, but the Irish news directly conflicts with the American news. And they make a big point out of they, there was no claim to there being 10 million. So there's a direct conflict in the West and how it's presenting this. It doesn't mean that Venezuela never made the claim, but I've not seen it anywhere. It appears to be um, a, a intentional rereading of what was said to make it sound like they're making a claim that they don't appear to have made. But I can't say for sure, uh, but check your sources carefully. Western media is not consistent on this point. Uh, in, in just between very strong, the EU and the US are not uh, giving the same news accounts. Um, so what happened though, this vote was should, and there's a number of items, but the important takeaway from it is that the Venezuelan people voted uh, overwhelmingly about 95% in favor of uh, taking action to reclaim this disputed zone. Uh, so we now believe, and we are seeing action on the ground, that Venezuela is making moves into this region to take it from Guyana. That may sound like a straight up annexation, but the situation is much more complex than that. And I had to look into it a bit. So before we get into what is happening, let's talk about the region of Essequibo. Essequibo is the Western two thirds of what we generally consider Guyana. That is a lot of land, but it is not a lot of people. It's about 125,000 people out of a country that has a population of just a little bit under 800,000. So it's, a, it's about a, sixth to a fifth of the total population um, of a very, very small country by population, but relatively large by land. What is important in a historical context with Guyana in recent times is that in the last few years, massive deposits of oil have been discovered within their territorial waters and potentially a little bit on land, but basically in their waters. And this is uh, some of the, the largest oil reserves per capita in the world. So this is creating a lot of social upheaval and a lot of things happening in Guyana. Uh, so this is important because they were found in the Essequibo, not in Guyana, in the undisputed territory. So this is in a disputed zone. Now, a lot of people are going to point to, oh, Venezuela is only interested in this because of the oil. And that is absolutely untrue. And there's no foundation for that. That is absolutely false. Anyone who's saying that, that's, you can just end there. They are not in any way portraying reality. What is reality is that there is little question that the discovery of this oil has prompted a need to take action where before there was patience. Uh, and we're gonna show why this is important looking at the historical context of this region specifically. This isn't just a general thing. This is very specifically the Essequibo and what has happened there over time. So the important history here in this zone is that in the early colonial period, this was always assigned as part of the Spanish colony. That Spanish colony would eventually become what is today Venezuela, and Venezuela has always, in its opinion, owned and administered this zone of the Essequibo. The original Dutch and later taken over by the British uh, territory, which is now Guyana, uh, claimed this zone as well. However, one of the problems is, is that neither Venezuela nor Guyana really occupied this area in any serious way. Essequibo was essentially a hinterland between the two, and this means, uh, much like we see these disputes around the world, when you have empty areas that have things in them, everyone's in a position of wanting to show that they've controlled it all along, and, and, and you really get into a he said, she said kind of situation because there is no clear occupation by a group of people who believe themselves to be a part of either place. And so uh, while that also causes problems and you don't want to be using uh, population movements as a form of colonization, but in reality people do, and it is often used as a way 
to disregard all other history and legality and seize a zone simply by changing the population and getting the people who are able to physically get into a place to vote to change its position. So that's something that could happen, but it's not what happened here. That's just a common thing happening other places that often makes things a bit more definitive. What we have here is a bit of history. Basically, Spain uh, claims ownership to this zone. The UK claims ownership to this zone, but the UK didn't claim ownership to it at all until about 1840, and Spain claimed it for hundreds of years before that. Uh, it, shortly after 1840, when Venezuela was trying to assert its borders, uh, there became a large border dispute in this zone. The border dispute pretty much always existed, but it wasn't that heated in the early days. By the 1870s, you had a situation where gold was discovered in the zone and it became hotly contested. England had more military in the area, Venezuela being a young independent colony that had broken away from Spain, and Guyana at the time being an active colony of England had the full resources of the British Empire. They were able to hold the zone even though it was disputed and it became a a uh, bit of a standoff. During that time, England began extracting gold. They severed diplomatic relations between Venezuela and England, uh, and they simply disputed the zone for a number of years. Very importantly, in 1899, there was an arbitration done to decide what would happen to the Essequibo. This arbitration was handled between the UK, United States, and Russia. You will notice very obviously that Venezuela was not involved in their own arbitration, which first of all shows a major problem right from the start. So somehow England managed to get binding arbitration decided without the people they were arbitrating against able to represent themselves. But the United States did represent Venezuela and in this case actively did represent them. The United States believed both in their role as a, as a representative, but politically at the time, that England should not have control of that zone, that it should be Venezuela's. And uh, they did so based both on colonial uh, history, as well as, and this does not generally get any credence, but under U.S. law, the Monroe Doctrine said that the U.S. would not allow England to interfere in the area, and in doing so, it should have invoked the United States military to protect the Americas from colonial invasion or encroachment, which is what was really believed to be happening here. England was trying to take a zone and make it a colony from an existing uh, country in the Americas. The uh, agreement of 1899, the arbitration, voted completely uh, for UK ownership of the zone. And so the colony, not the country, of Guyana received the Essequibo at that time. Shortly after that time, it came to light that the arbitration was not valid. This actually happened quite quickly that it turned out that Russia, who was supposed to be the neutral party overseeing the arbitration, had actually entered into a secret political deal with the United Kingdom to basically England purchased the zone from Russia by, by either uh, giving political um, uh, favors or actually paying them or whatever in order for Russia to overlook the obviousness that it should have gone to Venezuela. The United States later published both uh, officially and a number of legal authors at the time from very respected sources uh, published that um, there was little question that both under U.S. law and under international law, the zone should have gone to Venezuela. The U.K. really not having any claim to it legitimately um, and having used some amount of corruption or simply force of arms to seize control of a portion of Venezuela and extract the gold from it. So this is the starting point that at the beginning of the 20th century, this region of the Essequibo, which it is basically uh, assumed that all parties, Russia, the UK, and the US, as well as Venezuela, of course, and de facto Guyana, because they were a colony of England, all knew without any real doubt were the legal property of Venezuela. All the gold and minerals that lie within it were part of the uh, property of the Venezuelan people, and these were stolen from them through a corrupt arbitration process. Uh, because of this, Right, there is uh, this precedent for seizing this zone by force and stealing the, the mineral resources. So that's something that people have to be really aware of and really concerned about when we're looking at, when we're talking about uh, the history in this area. My battery units died in the house. I can't do anything to record without phones ringing, battery units beeping, people coming to the door. It's impossible, I'm sorry. So we have this precedent that if allowed to wait 
for the courts to wait for arbitration that there could be corruption. And while things are being decided, while things are being figured out, uh, all of the minerals get extracted from the country and there's nothing left for the people who claim to own it. And so this is a real problem. If you're looking at this from the Venezuelan perspective, they've been trying to use proper processes and go through courts and international appeals uh, and, and legal means to secure the land to have arbitration and what they were met with was illegality. Basically, they have proof that all parties believed that it belonged to them. It is simply accepted that England stole the gold from the Venezuelan people. And the very few people who live in that zone have been treated in many cases as jointly uh, Guayaban and as uh, Guayanan and as Venezuelan. Right, Venezuela will often give passports to people in that zone. So, so this is a very sticky situation, right? Because there was an arbitration, but because it is absolutely accepted by all parties as having been a false arbitration. So there was no uh, actual allotting to Guyana. Then in 1966, after a number of years of, of arguing about this, after 67 years, the Geneva Agreement was reached in which the arbitration of 1899 was dissolved and uh, British Guyana uh, and the United Kingdom and Venezuela all signed this, right? So they all agreed that the arbitration didn't actually happen, which of course means all that gold that was extracted was not England's to take at all uh, and that all that was illegal. But of course, nothing was done about that, right? So Venezuela is still being uh, mistreated there. Then uh, since that time, uh, the deal in the 1966 agreement was that um, that nothing would be done in the zone and that they would wait and they would have international arbitration again through a more neutral uh, system. That was 1966. Since that time, no such arbitration, no such court has ever actually taken up this case. There's some claims that one plans to do so in the future, but it's rather late now, right? We're already looking at more than 60 years uh, or roughly 60 years since they claimed they were going to do this and that they can't find anyone to do it. In that time, of course, England and its colony, because in 19, roughly 1966, uh, the colony of Guyana separated from England, they got their independence. And so now you're dealing with a new country that is claiming this territory that England was holding as a uh, colonial aggressing, uh, aggressive area. And now they're claiming it as part of their country. So this gets much messier because it used to be a colonial zone. Now it is a uh, area disputed, disputed by two sovereign nations that border each other. So very, very complicated, right? It's very complicated for the people who live there. For the uh, Guyanese, I think that's correct, um, this has been part of their, their territory in their minds forever. Their country was founded in 1966 and it's always been treated as part of their country. But they should also be aware that it was long disputed by that point and in no way was Venezuela in a position of letting it go and that uh, their parent country, England, had absolutely clearly not earned the right to that zone um, and that this was a hotly contested area that almost certainly the entire international community would view as always having been Venezuelans. One of the problems that happens worldwide is that once you control a zone, if you're given time, you can make people decide, well, it's too bad, it took too long, now it's yours. Possession, physical possession, the physical possession and military strength often wins. Um, and this is a, a significant problem on the world stage because it basically rewards bad behavior. If you do something corrupt, if you pay someone off, if you murder someone, if you steal something and manage to convince people that maybe you have just the slightest claim to it and that someone should arbitrate over a period of time and then you stall that arbitration. And I'm not saying that that's what anyone did here, but if all it takes is that arbitration stalling, whether it's intentional or accidental, and eventually whoever's been the administrator or perceived as the administrator during that time will almost certainly be granted the right of that area because of tradition, because of uh, just time passing. Right. Over this time, people from Guyana are able to move into the Essequibo very easily. People from Venezuela, it's very difficult. Venezuela would have to come in with military force and protect them if they did that because Guyana will openly 
act as though they are crossing an international boundary. Venezuela will not, but this makes it very difficult. So settlers aren't just coming in, they're threatened by Guyana. I'm not saying that anyone's actually pointing guns at them, but they have this risk of being detained or, or being deported or whatever. And so it's very difficult um, for, for an equal situation to exist. And that is what England and Guyana have been banking on for 124 years. Uh, so Venezuela has every reason to be very upset about this. And really the world should be very upset about this because this type of action should be treated as the opposite. That England took the gold from it, that England uh, falsely uh, did the arbitration, that they were willing to participate in a fake arbitration where they paid off the arbitrators. These things should be unequivocal. It should go immediately to Venezuela. It should be that they have absolutely no claims whatsoever. Nobody should accept their claims. No one should ever, ever consider supporting their position because what they did was so heinous that they, if they had they from the beginning said, we're not willing to arbitrate, we're going to fight for this zone, it's just a war, fine, right? You're, you're going to fight over it. And, and they probably would have won, almost certainly, but it would have been costly. But now there's this very strong pressure. Oh, Venezuela should not take up arms to try to protect their zone. That's not how this should be. It should be handled in the courts. But we've proven that the courts are corrupt. We've proven that the courts aren't an active uh, a process that can work. We've proven that it can't be done timely and that if it's not timely, we've de facto decided that the aggressor, England in this case, will win or its subsequent colony will. And so we should not be looking at it in that way. Um, and, and in looking at the history of this zone and looking at the history of the interactions on it, the one thing that I can't find is anything, any behavior that seems to give England the slightest reasonable claim or its subsequent uh, sovereign colonial state to Guyana, any reasonable claim other than we stole it, good luck taking it back. Um, that's where it's, it's common in the media to hear it referred to as, uh, well, now there's oil, now Venezuela wants it, but it's been Guyana's for all this time. That is False. It has not been Guyana's all this time. If you look on Google Maps, it is a disputed border zone. Uh, it is not listed as part of Guyana. It's listed as jointly um, um, claimed. It is uh, that Guyana has occupied it, but that is not a positive thing. Just because Guyana or England uh, over, the, over the years was willing to be aggressive should not be seen as a bonus for them. It maybe should not be a negative, but we should not be rewarding aggressive behavior by then saying responding with aggressive behavior to aggressive behavior is bad, right? We're, we're picking sides um, based off of nothing but the order in which things happen. If you were to say, oh, you know, uh, Germany invaded Czechoslovakia in 1939, um, you know, the Czechs shouldn't respond with guns. They should lay down, let Germany take over the country, and, uh, and then, you know, complain to a court and see after 50 years of, of the Germans administering the country and making everyone speak German and telling everyone that they're German and moving people around so there's actual Germans living within the country and populating it so that they will vote German because they're actual Germans who have moved in and then say, oh, sorry, it's been ours for a long time and it's full of Germans, so now it's ours by law and the whole world agrees because we took it by force. We basically all agree that we don't want a world where you simply get to take everything by force. Of course, traditionally, everything was taken by force. And this is kind of the roots of colonialism that uh, prior to modern times, uh, prior to the last 100, 150 years, it was generally accepted that if you came in with a large army and seized an area, you could do basically anything. It was not okay to commit genocide and kill everyone, but if they resisted, maybe, right? And it was always whoever had the guns, they rule. And there was, and there's a reason for that because it's very difficult to fight against that because ultimately whoever has the guns rules, right? But if the world gets together and say, well, we all have a lot of guns and we're going to stop individuals from, or individual small states from coming out and saying, we've got guns, we're going to take things just because we have guns, we can uh, have a more modern framework. And this is what basically the entire world has been arguing for, is that we need a way that you can't just uh, invade a neighboring country and have everyone agree that by having invaded it, now it's yours. You have to give it back, that it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's not a free-for-all, and because that's what we had traditionally, and the results were horrific over time. People would fight 
regularly over all kinds of territory. And not that it stopped so greatly today, but we have an opportunity to stop it. And this is a case where we're seeing that we're rewarding aggressive behavior. We're conditioning all of the parties, right? England has learned, Guyana has learned, Venezuela has learned, the United States has learned, everyone who is a party to this has learned that the worse you behave, the more the world is likely to reward you. And so now, because England and Guyana were aggressive, because they didn't wait for arbitration, because they occupied the territory, because they, they had more guns, because they started taking gold, because they got rich from it, all of that made the world go, well, the rich guy with all the guns, they must be the ones that are supposed to be there. If they weren't supposed to be there, I'm sure they wouldn't have been for so long. But it was, it was Venezuela letting the courts do their thing and trying to act like the good country in this situation that led to this situation now. And so this uh, is a very complicated situation because Guyana has controlled it for a long time. That's legitimate. They've had quite a bit of time, two generations of their country now who have grown up with this being a part of their country. They just assume it's part of their country. They now are excited that it's part of their country because it's full of oil. And now Venezuela says, I've waited so long to get justice in this. And it's clear that if Venezuela does not act now, right, they've been conditioned that the world will turn a blind eye to a Latin American country having its natural resources siphoned off by an English speaking country. That is what happened with the gold, and it will start happening with the oil. The, uh, the attempt to extract that oil has begun, and if there is nothing that is done to stop it, it will all be gone, gone, and in that time, they will be able to simply stall and have no arbitration take place, and then someday, when there's no resources left, no reason that anyone wants the land, then say, okay, now we'll, we'll stop fighting and Venezuela can have it, only because we've depleted it. And, that, and, and maybe they'll use it as a radioactive waste dump by then, right? It'll, it's, this is a terrible way for the system to work. And international disputes like this are complicated, right? Because there is no higher court than the countries themselves. Um, it is a very difficult situation because as sovereign states, it is up to them to recognize the different courts. And if those courts do not act uh, justly, if they accept bribes, if they simply you know, favor one country or another and are not looking at some uh, accepted set of standards, uh, there's very little that a country can do other than call them out and, and disregard their rulings. And that is always the fear that it'll simply, that one party or another will simply disregard things. And that's always a fear. So it's a very complicated, very across the board, very complicated. But I, I think this is very much worth looking at because in everything I hear, right? Uh, people are like, boy, oh, Venezuela seems like they're being very aggressive. And when I actually read anything on it, it sounds like, wow, Guyana and England have been very aggressive for 124, 126 years, 124 years. And well, and, and quite a bit before that, right? We're, we're pushing um, 150 years of very strong aggression of depleting this zone. And and we're looking at a country who is not willing to take it anymore now that there is a new opportunity for things to be stolen from them, that now it's time for them to take action. And I think Venezuela is correct. This is, one way or another, this is the time to take action. And maybe there are factors we don't know about. Maybe there are reasons why Venezuela um, should not have it. But clearly, Russia didn't think so. The United States didn't think so. England didn't have faith in that. Um, and in the years since, um, it's really difficult to find anyone who has made a strong argument for that. It seems that this is clearly Venezuelans by, by everyone's standards. And now Venezuela is simply not willing to let the media control the impression of this. Um, it was also uh, asked to me, well, it seems strange that the United States doesn't just step in, right? And this is very expected in many cases, right? Why does the United States not just step in? Because the U.S. likes to step in all over the place. Although it actually steps in less than people realize. The United States is certainly very steppy inny, right? That is that is who the Americas, uh, who America is on the world stage. But in so many cases, especially ones going on right now, the U.S. is often at arm's length at best. And in a situation like this uh, with Venezuela and Guyana, it's much more complicated than that. First of all, uh, Guyana represents uh, colonial power in, in England, right? So um, the from a U.S. legal perspective, Guyana is not um, a Western country. It is still uh, somewhat tied to England. The dispute that is going on is one that violates the Monroe Doctrine. So legally, the United States cannot 
uh, favor Guyana in this situation. It has to back Venezuela under the law, which mostly means the United States will likely to simply do nothing. They don't have to be involved. They just aren't supposed to uh, work against Venezuela under this very strong U.S. law that is used to dictate so much American policy. If the U.S. government was to violate the Monroe Doctrine, it would cause a ripple effect of problems in so many other areas. So because they rely so strongly on the Monroe Doctrine, they kind of have to stick with it here. The U.S. also needs to stick with the fact that it was Venezuela's uh, proxy for the original arbitration and argued for them. And after the argument, it was as a nation, recognize that the arbitration process was corrupt, that Venezuela was robbed in this in this situation. Um, and there is a lot of, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of legal uh, writings and precedents and, and publications um, about this situation that uh, have been published in the United States, um, and, and both in the United States. And in Sweden, um, important uh, scholars, uh, J. Gillis Wetter of Sweden in International uh, Arbitral Process 1979, uh, which um, was acknowledged by the American Society of International Law, uh, said that the nullification was just because of all the things that happened. Um, British official archives have turned up. Uh, the deal made with Russia. So this is not something that's been hidden. This is now part of public record. So there's really, this is not, um, uh, this is not a he said, she said kind of thing. At this point, this is very much a, we know that England stole this from Venezuela. That so much is fact. In 1899, everything that was taken out of the zone by England and its colony was theft from Venezuela. That is our starting point. That is, everyone agrees to that. Um, and then the question is, how much are we willing to let them continue to steal through public opinion and media? So that's kind of where it is. The United States also, uh, it would be very difficult to intervene in this situation. You're talking about two former colonies. Uh, you're talking about a local dispute. It has nothing to do with the United States. Um, everything that the United States does have of interest in it uh, financially maybe leans towards Guyana, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, but certainly all of its historic ties and legal ties are very strongly with Venezuela. So the United States is caught in this situation not being on the side that it necessarily wants to be on. It's currently in a uh, bit of a, a political turmoil with Venezuela, and the United States did not step in when there was major upheaval in Venezuela. If the United States was going to step in, that is when they likely would have stepped in, not at this much more minor point. Um, that, that would probably not make sense. And so given the historical interactions of the United States with Venezuela over the past decade, it feels extremely unlikely that the United States will want to become embroiled in the region at all. It is. Uh, it would be pushing its luck at a time where it's spread very thin with activities around the world. And this is one that does not really clearly benefit it in either direction. The United States does not have a huge win by supporting Venezuela, but also does not have a huge loss uh, by supporting uh, Venezuela. So they, they could go either direction based on a lot of factors. And so when it's something neutral like that, but the potential cost is very high, as it could be here, um, it's it's nobody is likely to want to be involved in anything beyond a containment effort, which of course Brazil has already moved military to their shared border because this zone is heavily bordered by Brazil uh, and Brazil wants to make sure there is no spillover into Brazil, of course, which there probably is not going to be. There's very unlikely to be any strong military action within the zone at all. What we expect to see, and this is my personal analysis, is a rapid attempt at colonization or reverse colonization. Um, the people who live in the zone are already being granted uh, passports from Venezuela. So Venezuela has recognized it as their eighth state. They added it to their flag as a star in 2006. So we're looking at 17 years of them being on the flag, like the Essequibo is part of Venezuela, is an accepted part of Venezuelan culture. So no big deal there. That's that's just how we expect it to be. Um, and, and so it's really a process of shifting the public perception of where the lines are, and as long as Venezuela is able to have its citizens move freely throughout the zone and they're able to extract oil from the zone that it controls at sea, there is unlikely to be any further action from Venezuela. They don't need to have Guyana, uh, Guyana not enter the zone in any way. If they want to simply be able to pass through with trucks, they probably don't care. There's an opportunity here for a joint operating zone where they really do share a lot of territory because they traditionally do. Uh, and so... 
if they can keep from becoming uh, incredibly antagonistic with each other, uh, Guyana may simply need to recognize that it is going to lose this zone. If there's going to be a fight, why have a fight that you know you're going to lose? It is a very, very small country, uh, and Venezuela is a, a rather large one, right? It's it's about 35 to 40 times the population of Guyana, with many times uh, its resources militarily, uh, with historic precedents that Venezuela has an active military, Guyana does not really. Um, there's just a lot of things that weigh really heavily in Venezuela's favor. Uh, and so we would not expect uh, to see Guyana do well uh, if they were to provide uh, a, a real pushback against this, this Venezuelan um, annexation is how they see it. And it is, I think, unlikely that anyone is going to be able to create a good argument for supporting Guyana. That doesn't mean that they won't get a lot of international support. Very rarely is a good argument needed uh, for supporting an aggressor. We often just find a lot of global support for aggressive nations. Um, and so Guyana may be able to simply play on that, but Venezuela may also be playing on that aggressors have been generally being get, been given a blind eye in recent years. And so they can take a much more aggressive stance, probably with impunity, because why would they be the country that is picked out? This is a very small population. It is a very small uh, impact to human life. They are not trying to wipe out the people that are there. They're trying to recognize that those people are Venezuelan and bring them into the fold and give them all the rights and power of Venezuelans. And of course, the people who live in that zone stand to potentially gain a lot by becoming Venezuelans, access to a much larger country, access to many more resources, and whichever side they end up on, they are on the side that gets all the oil from that zone, so they are set to benefit from that regardless. The people who are set to lose are the 600,000 or so people who live east of the river in what is non-disputed Guyana with Georgetown. Um, that is where the bulk of the population is, but not where the oil is, which is what raises the problem in the first place. So that is my analysis of what is currently going on with Venezuela and Guyana. I expect that to be big in the news for those who are paying attention to world events. Uh, for a lot of people, it is simply swept under the rug. People don't know where Guyana is. They have no idea what's happening. A lot of people think it's an island and not a major landmass on the South American continent. And so uh, it, is, it is very difficult to get uh, public opinion interested in this, but it is a very important event that is going on and could potentially significantly shape what South America looks like over the next 50 to 100 years. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe if you'd like to support this channel. And This is not normally what we do. We're normally here in Nicaragua talking about travel and relocation uh, or visiting Bolivia or whatever, like traveling the world. And uh, But this is an important bit of world events that affects this region. And I really wanted to share that with you and get some necessary information out there that I think people are almost always missing. Um, but if you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to me. It's like Patreon helps make this show possible and everything that we do. And as always, like and subscribe, post on social media, tell your friends, family about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow.